Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Yale Center Beijing's events. Uh, my name is Joyce Wang, the Deputy Director of the Center. Uh, first of all, I will use Chinese uh, to briefly introduce our center. Uh,大家晚上好,欢迎参加耶鲁北京中心举办的网络活动。我是中心的副主任Joyce。首先呢,我想为第一次参加我们中心活动的朋友呢,简单的介绍一下我们中心。我们中心是成立一四年的十月是耶鲁大学历史上首次在美国本土校园以外设立的一个实体中心到现在我成立差不多六年的时间然后举办了很多主题不同的这个数百场活动现在已经成为了汇聚各界精英领袖的一个重要
And so thank you again for joining us. And without further ado, here is Dr. Mary Kreider. I'm gonna share the screen and, and we'll I'm going to go right there. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about sleep during the pandemic and, and I'm beginning um, uh, with this image. This is actually a painting that I bought in China about five years ago. And uh, I tried to locate the, the painter and I have no idea uh, who the painter is. And if anybody out there recognizes this work of art, uh, I'd really appreciate it uh, because it's a beautiful image and I frequently show this, this, this image uh, during a class that I run at Yale where I'm talking about sleep and art because this is an absolutely gorgeous image. So what are we gonna talk about today? So these are the topics. So we've, some of us are still going through the, this pandemic and some of us have gone through the pandemic and the sleep issues that arose during the pandemic are insomnia, nightmares, sleep breathing disorders, and who was affected? Everybody was, the public, uh, we as individuals, and of course, our patients. I, as a doctor, have seen many patients that have had sleep issues because of the pandemic. So late in 2019, our planet, our planet was attacked by a never before encountered silent virus. And so the first reports of this uh, virus came, of course, from, from China. And this graph really shows the number of infected cases over the last uh, six months. And so as you could see, there was a peak in, in February and then things leveled off fairly quickly. So th those were the first reports. And my world as a professor at Yale changed on March the 10th, 2020 at 7.51 p.m. before there was a single case um, in Connecticut. And this was an email that came from the president of the university, Peter Salovey. And the fine print of this email was this, moving classes online when they resume after spring recess, all the students. So this all happened during the spring recess at Yale, asking students to remain home or return home when possible, limiting international and domestic travel at the time, continuing research and teaching and restricting the uh, size of events. And the staff was told, people like me were told, if you can work at home, you're gonna have to work at home. So in some ways, uh, Peter Salovey, even before anything happened uh, in our community, was ready and there was a plan in place of how to deal with the situation, but there were issues. What happened? Students were stranded all over the place. I remember getting an email from a student who was living in England, but who happened to be in Florida during spring break, and she was trapped. She could not get home uh, because of uh, travel restrictions uh, had already started they were not able to return to the residential colleges, which were in essence closed. Professors had to teach remotely. And for some professors who had never really used Zoom or anything like that, this was actually very anxiety um, uh, initiating and it was really a, a big problem. And that was only the beginning of, of, of this um, of pandemic and it hadn't even come into into our community yet. So while all this was going on, while all this was going on, what was happening to people's sleep? Well, Yale student sleep was not great to begin with. And this, uh, this is sort of a homemade chart where students put a little sticker to indicate how many hours they slept at night. Uh, and as you can see, many students many students slept only between five and six hours and many students also slept between three and four hours so yale students sleep wasn't great to begin with 
So people, once the pandemic started, there were sleep concerns that popped up all over the place. And the first one that popped up was insomnia. People who had never had insomnia before, all of a sudden had insomnia. And here's some stuff from social media. Anyone else having pandemic insomnia and afraid to fall asleep, just me, finally turned off the news stories, but I think they've already done their damage. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. So there were thousands and thousands of people internationally who were for the first time in their life, they were complaining they had insomnia. The other thing that a lot of people were complaining about, and this again was new, is that people were now having not just insomnia, when they did fall asleep, they were having very weird dreams. And some people call them coronavirus dreams, pandemic dreams. And some of the dreams um, were really weird in, the, in that people were dreaming about things very vividly and they hadn't been vivid dreamers before. So this was something that was new as well. People having very vivid dreams. Some of them were very disturbing and some were not. So once the pandemic started, um, and this is now data from this company that actually keeps track of medication use in the United States, all of a sudden there was a big increase in prescriptions filled for antidepressants and anti-anxiety and anti-insomnia medications. So all of a sudden, and you'll notice that the biggest change was for medications having to do with anxiety. And this is between February the 16th and March the 15th. And this is before the pandemic actually reached its uh, serious proportions in the, um, in the US. March the 15th, not much had happened yet in the United States. So one of the things I'm gonna talk about is that sleep problems occur during and after catastrophes, all catastrophes, not just this current pandemic. And I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about a book that many of you have read. <coughs> Excuse me. So most of you have read this book, The Call of the Wild by Jack London. And this was published in 1903. The author was only 27 years old. And for those of you who are uh, Yale sort of history buffs, he actually gave a lecture at Yale after he uh, published this book uh, that was attended by a very large number of, of, of students and faculty. And it was actually reported, uh, this presentation that he did at Yale was actually reported in the New York Times. So most of you have read this book. He was 27 years old, 1903. And these are, uh, it was a huge, it was the biggest selling book uh, in, in the US up to that time. And these are all the editions and there were even some Chinese editions um, of this book. Very, very popular. Well, um, a friend of mine lives in Glen Ellen, California where Jack London lived. And so I went to visit Jack London's house and this was a poster at his house and, uh, and on top of this poster, it said 13 years later, he was dead. 13 years, uh, uh, it was sort of an, an, an amazing sort of story. He was only 40, 40 years old when he died. So what was the story with him? Why did he die? So I visited, uh, this is his bedroom and his home in, in Glen Ellen, California, and the bottom of the picture shows you the head of his bed and above the bed, you'll see a string and on the strings are with clothespins messages that he kept to himself. Why? Because he had developed very severe insomnia. And what he did when he couldn't sleep was make notes to himself. Well, why did he have this severe insomnia? Well, in 1906, three years after he wrote this book, occurred the San Francisco earthquake. 
and London witnessed firsthand the catastrophic disaster caused by this earthquake, which was April the 18th, 1906. And he, he, he was there, he, he, he saw what happened, things burning, animals burning, buildings burning. Uh, this, was, this scene, when I first saw this photograph, reminded me of, of some of the images from 9-11, a huge catastrophe. So he witnessed this. And then he developed severe insomnia. And this is what he wrote in, in, in one of his books. My sleep was broken by miserable nightmares. Earthquake seemed the favorite affliction. He became addicted to products that help him sleep. He died at the age of 40. And as you'll see later on, and I'm gonna talk about this, is that people, who live through a pandemic, who live through a catastrophe, many of them are going to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is what I'm sure um, uh, he actually had. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. So a hundred years ago, insomnia medically was not considered a big deal. It was considered, oh, you have insomnia, not a big deal, part of an overactive mind, that can't shut off, and the brain was engaged in unfinished business. And then thinking changed, uh, and e external events were then, re people realized that external events can play a role. And this is an example of our thinking about insomnia uh, in 1940. So the, the, the thinking at that time is that it wasn't a big deal and the insomnia was related to external factors that kept you from falling asleep. 60 years later, the whole um, thought about insomnia and, and what it can do changed. And this is now an example of that. So our thinking had changed and, and that movie sort of reflected how our thinking changed that if someone had insomnia, it had repercussions, it had an effect on the person's brain, it had an effect on the way the person thought. So insomnia, our thinking changed that insomnia was now a big deal, it had consequences and it needed to be treated and I'm gonna be talking about treatment a little bit later. So our thinking changed. So what do we, when we use the word insomnia, what do we mean, right? Difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, early morning awakening, and feeling non-refreshed. And this is the way a person with insomnia might appear, uh, listless, possibly anxious, and just looking like they're having a real, real problem. So insomnia is a real issue. So the, the prevalence of insomnia, in other words, the percentage of the population with insomnia varies across the lifespan. And as you can see, um, it is very, very common in people above the age of 40, 
below the age of 40, it is, it is less common, but it's still there. And we see a lot of it, for example, among Yale students, some of whom are actually quite anxious. But you'll also notice that it's much more common in females than in males. And that's true throughout the entire lifespan. That in, for example, in, in, in people between the ages of 60 and 69, it's about twice as common in women as it is in men. So how common is it in terms of a problem? So 40% of North American adults experience occasional insomnia, maybe twice a year, once a year, whatever. Fifth, 10 to 15% have insomnia on a chronic basis. What do I mean by that? They have trouble sleeping at least three times a week for at least three months. And those who are most at risk are women, older adults, and people with depression. So, um, so there are different types of insomnia. Commonest cause of, of, of insomnia is what I'm labeling here as acute insomnia. Uh, I, uh, I, I hope you can appreciate that my mouse doesn't appear to be working, but we will figure that out. So, the, the, so what causes acute insomnia and acute illness? An, an emotional stress, uh, for example, for students, papers are due, dissertations, exams. I see a lot of students um, uh, from Yale who are having acute and, and, and insomnia related to those kinds of things. How long does that type of insomnia last? Usually it'll last for a couple of weeks, usually, and it, then it'll often just get better. So, so this is an acute type of insomnia, but now we're in a very, very different situation because of this pandemic. So what was previously an acute insomnia now has become chronic. In other words, this stress wasn't like, uh, you know, an acute stress, something that was there for uh, you know, a month or, or a week. This has now been going on for a long period of time. So the acuteness has now become chronic. And so, um, so, so it, it's been lasting for at least one month in some countries, uh, and it's been continuous now um, in, in some nations uh, since March. So uh, that will eventually result in chronic stress, hyperarousal, learned, uh, counterproductive behaviors that may con contribute. So the insomnia, which, which has started in many people during the pandemic, may now last up to decades in, in some patients. We don't know that yet, but we suspect that that's going to be the situation. So insomnia develops. Nobody is born with difficulty sleeping. So there are predisposing factors to the development of insomnia. Age, as you saw before, as people get older, they're, they're, they are more likely to develop insomnia, gender, females, and genetics. In some families, um, in some families uh, insomnia is common. It seems to be passed on from one generation to the other. But in most people, even though they have these predisposing factors, they have the genes, right? Um, um, they don't actually have insomnia yet. And what y triggers the insomnia is what I'm calling precipitating factors. It could be pain, it could be an acute stress. And right now the acute stress is the pandemic and medications can also cause it. So there are precipitating factors which take the patient over the insomnia threshold and they now continue to have insomnia. And then there are the development of what I'm calling perpetuating factors. And these are maladaptive behaviors that keep the insomnia going. So let's say you have pain, you develop insomnia, the pain goes away, if you have 
maladaptive behaviors, and some of them uh, could be, for example, drinking too much caffeine because you've lost sleep and you want to be more alert during the daytime. All of this caffeine can actually perpetuate uh, the insomnia, and there are many other per, uh, perpetuating factors. So, so this is the way um, insomnia develops in, in a given person. So what was insomnia? Until about 2005, the thinking was it's a complaint. It's not really a disease. It has many causes and you simply treat the cause and the insomnia is going to go away. So in, in 2005, there was a big meeting at the NIH in Washington where they really redefined what insomnia was. So it, it was still a complaint, people complain about it. Whereas previously it was not thought of as being a disease, it now is considered a disease and it is often comorbid with. What that means is that uh, the person who's having uh, trouble sleeping will often have another medical condition that actually um, is associated with insomnia that could be lung diseases, asthma, cough, could be heart failure, it could be depression. So it, it was comorbid with something. And then, whereas previously we just thought about treating the cause, we're now thinking about we need to treat the comorbidity, the other disease that is contributing to the insomnia and treating the insomnia directly. So, there, so that was a pretty big change in the thinking about this problem. And here are just an example. I don't expect you to become doctors, but these are just some of the comorbid insomnias that we're talking about. Mood disorders, depression, anxiety, drug and alcohol abuse, schizophrenia, and so forth. And on the right side, you could see medical conditions and virtually every single organ system has diseases that can result in difficulty in sleeping. So what is going on in the brain in, in people who have insomnia? What is going on uh, in the brain? Clearly something is happening there. So it turns out that the brain of an insomniac is hypermetabolic. It's active when it shouldn't be active and different parts of the brain, especially the brains that deal with what we call arousal systems are, are they're lit up, they are, they are lit up. And in this study, we're looking at whole brain metabolism and controls and people with insomnia. And it turns out that people with insomnia, even when they're awake, have a more active brain, okay? They're, they're, it's hypermetabolic. And when they're asleep, they also have a much higher um, metabolic rate. And their metabolic rate when they're asleep is actually higher than a normal person who is awake. In other words, their brain is really functioning and behaving as though it were awake. So insomnia seems to be a manifestation of behavioral psychological or biologic dysfunction. It's a, it's a condition of what we call hyperarousal. And when we talk about hyperarousal, it's not just at night that uh, this hyperarousal is a 24 hour uh, problem and it's not just at night. It's not just at night. And a lot of us right now around the world are hyper aroused because of changes in our world with this pandemic. So here's our new reality here at Yale. And so this shows you, um, this shows you um, um, the impact in our local community here. And what I'm showing you here are the number of people that were in the hospital at Yale New Haven Hospital between mid-March and actually two days ago. Actually, this is from yesterday, yesterday's data. And you'll notice that there wasn't a single case at the time 
that Dr. Salovey sent out that email that I talked about before. There were zero cases uh, in the hospital at that time. And the peak was about 450 patients in the hospital at the same time. And uh, you'll notice on the bottom here, the number of patients uh, who were on ventilators um, it peaked at around 75 patients on breathing machines, on ventilators. And now, there, um, yesterday, there were 15 people in the hospital with COVID, and two of them were still on ventilators. So this was our new reality at Yale. And I can tell you that there was a huge amount of stress in the, in, in the community in, in New Haven and Connecticut, and actually in the rest of the country, um, during this time. So what I'm showing you here is the impact of this pandemic on Connecticut, where, uh, where we, we live, where Yale is. And you'll notice again, the peak in the number of deaths was in the middle of April. It was in the middle of April. And slowly, the numbers went down and down. And the governor of Connecticut has been, um, I thought he, I think he's done a great job in actually um, getting the public to social distance, to put on masks, and not to congregate in very large groups. And the numbers sort of kept on going down and down. And, but in the rest of the United States, we have a problem. So uh, we have a problem in mid-April uh, uh, was sort of a, a, a temporary peak, the first wave. Things settled down a little bit by May, by the beginning of June, things started to look okay. And then um, a, a, lot of the, um, a lot of the rules from in various states changed and all of a sudden the number of new cases went up and up and up and continues to go up. And this is data uh, up to a couple of days ago, uh, July the 16th. So the number of deaths, okay? So the number of deaths peaked um, in, in, um, in mid-April. So the number of deaths peaked and at that time, um, the situation in New York City was horrible. They were having between 700 and 800 deaths every single day in New York City. Uh, and they eventually got things under control. And for the nation as a whole, one would have liked to have seen, um, at least by May, uh, the numbers going down and down, but they didn't go down and down. And the number of deaths really, is, right now, July the 16th is about the same as it was at the end of May. It seems like there hasn't been national progress in this. So now the United States and every country in the world has lived through catastrophes. They've lived through wars, polio, which was a huge um, uh, problem in the 1930s to the early 1950s. AIDS, HIV, 9-11, hurricanes, floods, superstorms. The world and the United States has lived through many of these. And people are talking about, at least in the United States, that there's a war going on uh, with this virus. So we have lived through a lot of things. And the, these are some examples of the wars that the United States has lived through. And the most recent war that has had a great impact uh, was Vietnam. So the Vietnam War was 58,000 deaths in about, 40, in about 14 years. The average number of deaths was about 11. And the worst year in Vietnam, which was 1968, there were 46 deaths per day. There were 46 deaths per day. This is data from the United States uh, yesterday. There were 141,000 deaths. Almost three times the number of people have died in this pandemic than during the entire Vietnam War. 
And the first case in the United States was January the 20th. And since then, the average number of people dying in the United States has been almost 800 people. So this is 20 times the death rate, roughly, that was occurring in the worst year of Vietnam. And in that worst year of Vietnam, 1968, and then in 1969, there were protests in, in, in the street. There was all sorts of stuff going on, huge amount of anxiety out there. Um, and so this is to sort of frame how big a problem this pandemic is to the US. This is a life-changing um, event that hopefully it'll only happen to us once in our lifetime. So I'm in the section of pulmonary and critical care and most of my colleagues um, went into hospital working every single day during this pandemic. So imagine that this is the start of your day and think about what your sleep was like the night before. And this is the end of your day. This is the end of your shift and you're encountering a, a patient uh, who's having a lot of difficulty breathing and you're trying to relate to them and treat to them knowing that a large percentage of these patients in this condition are going to not make it. So this is the end of your day. For many people and for many faculty at Yale and staff at Yale, um, they were basically sent home and they were working from home. And I'm guessing a lot of the people who are on this uh, um, um, lecture who are at Yale are still working from home. And so this is what our day or night be became. And so the circadian rhythm, our body clock, for sleep, wake, and meals got all messed up, got all messed up uh, because we, we simply weren't in our usual situation. So our world has changed in so many ways and there's a lot of anxiety out there. When people go to a store, will I transmit uh, COVID to someone else? Will I get COVID by simply shopping? So there was all this anxiety related to the changes uh, that have occurred um, that are out of our control. So thinking about, uh, about the average American today, what are they thinking about, okay? They think about, can they give um, their family COVID? Or th have they done something that will infect the rest of their family? What about the next meal? Shopping has become a huge deal. And, and where am I gonna get the next meal? At the beginning of the pandemic, there was a huge amount of anxiety about simply, do I have enough food? I don't know how long this is going to last. And so uh, all sorts of businesses sort of arose. Um, those of you who live in the United States will recognize Instacart, where somebody will shop for you and have the food delivered to your house. So people began to be to feel isolated. There were no more family, uh, big family meals, um, and there was a disconnect from the rest of, of the families and friends. Zoom sessions. I, I probably ended up having, oh gosh, at least one Zoom session every working day, sometimes as many as two or three um, Zoom sessions. Exercise, at least early on in the pandemic, was a real big deal because people couldn't do their usual exercise. They were afraid to go out. If they were going to a gym, the gym was closed. And then Netflix. And I'm, uh, it, people started to try to find things to keep themselves busy. And they started watching things on Netflix that never they would have never watched before. Um, and, and a lot of the stuff on net, some of it is great, a lot of it is, is garbage, as you know, but people needed to do something in order to keep their mind away from other things. So the, this is what people were thinking about 
during their everyday life. And, and this is bizarre, and people have written about this, and I witnessed this firsthand in my home. People started to do things they had never done before. So my son, who actually spent uh, a lot of, uh, he actually uh, spent three months uh, in, in our house because it wasn't safe where, where he was living. He started to bake bread. He had never in his life baked bread before, and he baked bread sourdough bread um, uh, and it just blew it blew our minds here was a kid who was not the least bit interested in cooking all of a sudden became a baker and it was kind of ironic uh, um, is that my mother my mother's family were a family of bakers and I've always wondered about whether there was a genetic connection there so then people started thinking about tomorrow Okay, we know the situation today. What about tomorrow? Will Yale still be around? In other words, how is Yale going to react to the changes that are gonna to have to be made? And so people started thinking about this. I started thinking about this. You know, I'm a professor at, at a university here and will it be around in a few years? Will I get COVID? When will I see my friends again? I mean, I have not seen my colleagues in person, I've seen them on many Zoom calls. I have not seen them for four months. I, I've been sheltering in place since March the 13th. When will I see my friends again? What about life outside? What, you know, going to restaurants, traveling? Uh, um, my wife and I, we were supposed to do a big trip uh, in May. Of course, uh, of course it got canceled and whatever, that's a whole other story. And when will I see my kids again? Okay, this became a sort of a big issue. Is my, my children, one family, um, um, my middle son lives in, in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, a daughter lives in New Jersey. And the big thing that came out is when will I see them again? You know, when will I see them again? And then you're thinking about a vaccine. When are we gonna have a vaccine? When will all this, craziness be over and my god am i ever going to go into a nursing home where where some nursing homes people uh die in in huge numbers i was talking um uh, about a week ago with my daughter-in-law who's a pharmacist she's a uh, she has a doctorate in pharmacy and she specializes in geriatric pharmacy and she consults in nursing homes she told me that one of her nursing homes, and this was in Pennsylvania, had 60 deaths of their residents, okay? That affects her, it affects us, simply knowing that a lot of elderly people are not making it. Will we ever travel again? Right now, Yale has told us, you can't travel, simple. And what will be the new norm? What will the world be like uh, uh, moving forward? So there was, the, so what I just showed you was anxiety about stuff going on today, but then the thinking about whether things are gonna become normal at some point in the future. So many people before going to sleep, they wanna sort of catch up on what is going on. So what do they catch up on? They catch up on, on the latest news. Uh, and what's going on with Dr. Um, uh, Anthony Fauci. This is, you know, so a lot of people do this before going to sleep, or they'll read um, the, you know, a newspaper, for example, the New York Times. That doesn't help either, because there are all these terrible stories about what is going on. Uh, you know, they're talking about the number of cases, the testing is scarce, um, is it safe to go out and eat and so forth. So catching up with the news doesn't help either, really. So, and you hear these stories, okay? Uh, uh, and this is people you don't know, terrible news. Top ER doctor who treated virus patient dies by suicide. She tried to do her job and it killed her. And this young lady who is a brilliant doctor in charge a, a, of an emergency department, um, she, she she killed herself. And before she killed herself, 
I, I heard this inter interview um, after she had died with her sister who said she couldn't sleep. And when you can't sleep, it just magnifies the anxiety that you might have had with what you observed during the day. And so if you're a doctor and you know that 20 or 30 percent of every person you're going to treat that day is going to die, it has a tremendous impact on you. And, and, uh, it, and it, it had its toll. And then there are people you do know. Uh, so I, there are two people that I know who died of, of COVID and one person who died because of COVID. And this is an example of one of the first deaths um, that actually occurred in, in Connecticut, uh, April the 16th, 2020. And he was a colleague of mine. He was a pulmonary uh, physician and we both had worked at the same sleep clinic um, in North Haven for a few years. And so he, he got sick, he was on a ventilator and he didn't make it off. And, and so when someone you know dies, that has a tremendous effect on you. So then there are the success stories. So this is a, 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 a colleague of mine in California who was on a breathing machine for several weeks in a drug-induced coma because he had developed respiratory failure because of COVID. And he made it. And, and I keep in touch with him. He left the hospital about a month, uh, I guess it's about a month and a half ago now. And he still has the residua. His respiratory failure is gone, but he has tremendous weakness uh, and he's nowhere near what he was um, uh, prior to, to being infected. In other words, this isn't the kind of disease where you have a cold and you get back to normal in a week. This is a disease where you can die because of respiratory failure. And this is a disease that has long-term consequences. And we don't know all of them yet. Many uh, patients who've gone through uh, what my friend has gone through end up having weakness, neurological problems, and many of them are going to develop post-traumatic stress that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. So all the things that I just mentioned, they mess up our circadian rhythm, they mess up our body clock, they lead to hyperarousal. They lead to the brain being much more active than, a, than it should be. Dramatic uh, mood swings, hearing terrible news followed by hearing great news. And so that results in chronic changes in the brain, insomnia, and weird dreams or nightmares. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about nightmares. Because if a nightmare is repetitive, and it really replays the psychologically traumatic event, that is a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. And so if, if you're a doctor taking care of a patient and your nightmares relate to that event and it, you have it over and over again, you have post-traumatic stress disorder and you'll, and you'll often wake up at night in a sweat, heart beating real fast and frightened. And what can often happen is you'll develop a fear of falling asleep because you don't want to have these nightmares. And that is what happened to Jack London. That's what happened to Jack London. He had nightmares about the earthquake and what he saw and smelled uh, um, when, when he went into, when he was in San Francisco r right after the earthquake. And what I want to emphasize is that having these nightmares with post-traumatic stress disorder isn't, it doesn't often go away. Um, and, and it can be present up to 70 years after the traumatic event. I've actually had patients, I've actually had patients who um, were Holocaust survivors who had been in concentration camps during the Second World War, and they still had nightmares about what they experienced 
during the Second World War, which ended in 1945. Um, and so th th these nightmares, these, this insomnia can last for a very, very long time after the um, event is over. Most of us look forward to sleep. And most of us have always looked forward to sleep because we knew we would wake up and we'd feel great and start our, our day. For many, right now, sleep has become torture and distressing. And insomnia becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The thought, I know I will have trouble sleeping, will, will lead to trouble sleeping. And some people develop a fear of falling asleep because they know they will have a bad night. So sleep itself can become traumatic and people can be trapped in that vicious circle. So meanwhile, many people right now need help to sleep. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about this. I'm gonna talk about what people can do to improve their sleep during this very difficult time. So life for you, life for someone going through the pandemic can be chaotic, but it's important to keep a regular routine. So even if you have more people in your home than you usually do, you should keep your schedule, keep rise times, meal time, exercise routines and bedtimes the same if you can. The brain loves regularity. It's fine to nap between noon and 4 p.m. and for about 30 minutes. You get tired at that time and your body expects it. Find ways to treat cabin fever. Take a drive, wear a mask if you take a drive, tend to your garden, go to a, a park. Again, wear a mask if you go to a park. And to improve your sleep, there are things you need to avoid. You need to avoid caffeine after noon. You should not exercise late in the day or right before you're trying to sleep. Avoid late day naps. In other words, it's okay to nap at one o'clock in the afternoon. It's not okay to nap at 6 p.m. Avoid alcohol and smoking before bed. Avoid a late dinner and avoid screens. And avoid this kind of stuff. Avoid eating something that's going to give you heartburn, that, that is going to stress your, your, your body. People with heartburn <clears throat> have trouble fall, falling asleep. Have a bedtime snack if desired. And the bedtime snack, it could, it could be peanuts, peanut butter, fruit, whatever. Eat something healthy as you're trying to go to sleep. Take a hot bath. As you cool off, you may get sleepy. And, and, um, uh, and this is known physiology that as we fall asleep, our body temperature drops. And when you take a hot bath, your brain thinks it needs to cool off and it actually helps you fall asleep. Have a, re a relaxing bedtime routine. And there should be a physical and mental buffer zone between work and sleep. In other words, you shouldn't have your computer in, in, in your bedroom if, if possible. In some places that's not possible to separate them, but try to at least mentally separate your work and your sleep. Don't do this. Do not watch the late news. Do not watch um, uh, all this very bad stuff r related to the virus in the two or three hours before bedtime. This is going to make you anxious uh, just knowing what is going on. I suppose that once things get better and the news is better, then you can go back to doing that, but don't do that now. So the sleep environment needs to be dark, um, and, and try removing any electronic screens and use eye masks or blackout curtains. So electronic screens, actually the light from an electronic screen can actually cause a brain arousal. Make it quiet, uh, make it cool, 
uh, and for example, you can use a fan uh, which actually can mask any outside noise and make it comfortable and address any issues with bed partners, children, pets. Make sure that all of those things that can disturb your sleep are taken care of and limit activities in the bed to intimacy and sleep and, and, and relaxation. Uh, I, I've done Zoom calls where the person at the other end is literally in their bed doing a Zoom call. And, and this is like a terrible idea because your brain is going to start to associate the bed with work. And you don't want that. Sleep time. Go to bed only when you're drowsy. But once you're, you're, you're drowsy, don't delay because you might get a second wind. By second wind is that if you don't fall asleep when you're sleepy and, and, and you wait too long, you're gonna have trouble falling asleep. And this is something that you certainly see in very young children who become hyper aroused when they're really sleepy. Don't watch the clock and don't do the math set your alarm and then turn the clock away or get rid of it. I tell people to get rid of their alarm clock because there's nothing about an alarm clock that actually helps you. If you need an alarm clock, it means you're not getting enough sleep. Don't try to sleep. So instead do something relaxing after 10 minutes if you can't fall asleep or if you can't get back to sleep. Um, in other words, lying in bed, not sleeping, becoming frustrating, becoming frustrated simply makes everything worse. So what can you do? Uh, you can read a book, podcasts, audio books, drawing uh, pads, whatever. There's a lot of stuff that you can do. Poor choices are looking at the news, social media, emails, texting, working. Um, I, I've had patients who, when they woke up in the middle of the night, when they had trouble sleeping, would start to watch a movie and all of a sudden they're watching a two hour movie at three o'clock in the morning. Don't do that. Do stuff that's not arousing to the brain. So let's say a person does have a bad night of sleep, what can they do? Well, remember the word calf to remind yourself that caffeine activity light exposure and food, these all help to make you feel more alert. So I'm gonna uh, end right now by, by, this is something that I wrote, uh, actually at the beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, I wrote an article about what, uh, what will happen after the pandemic. We will return to nor normality. It may be different, but we will celebrate births and birthdays. We will attend gatherings at homes and houses of worship and sporting events. We will shop and travel, eat in restaurants and hug each other. We will celebrate life. And, and a lot of people right now are very discouraged, but, uh, but the world has gone through many pandemics before. It's gone through many catastrophes before. And we will get through this one as well. And, and we will remember this. We will remember this. And hopefully, we're going to remember the fact that we got through it. Most of the people, we got through it. And uh, life will continue. It may be different, but life will continue. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions. And I'm All going right. to stop sharing. For some reason, my let me see here. If I, okay, there we go. I just stopped sharing. So there you are, Devin. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I know that people are already anxious to ask questions. Uh, so let me just kind of go through really quickly how this will work. So people can either use the raise hand function under the participants uh, section or the Zoom group chat. And I will do my best to call on uh, as many people as possible so that we can get through all the questions. Um, I know that a lot of people, when it comes to sleep, have very personal questions. Um, <laughs> do your best to ask your personal questions in a way that may be applicable to other people as well. Um, and of course, um, if possible, please turn on your cameras just so it's possible for um, us to see who 
uh, we're talking to. Um, so let's start with some of the raised hands. Uh, Vespra, do you want to go ahead? Okay, Vespra, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yep, there you go. Hi, can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah, we'd like Wait, to see you as you well. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, so yeah, my question is more about like, so I'm a student at uh, University of Southern California at Los Angeles, but I'm currently at Beijing and I'm probably gonna uh, take online courses like for the next semester. So I just wondering if you have any like advice for us probably gonna live like a reverse day and night experience. So how can we kind of like improve our sleeping schedule when we have to kind of like wake up in the middle of the night and take online courses? I mean, th this is actually a huge challenge. This is actually a yeah. huge challenge. And, and obviously, um, obviously the whole, me the mechanics of teaching are gonna have to change because uh, there are times when there's going to be a lecture and or a presentation or something and it'll be in the middle of the night for you and nobody wants you to wake up in the middle of the night uh, to hear a, or see a lecture why because your brain is practically asleep you're not going to remember 99 percent of what you have just heard and so one of the things we we realize is that uh, and this is one of the advantages of uh, online stuff is you can record it this is being recorded and you'll be able to see it and tell all of your friends what a wonderful lecture this was. But anyways, uh, I'm, I'm just teasing. Um, but this is the, what you may need to have to do is to use, um, uh, is to look at things that have been recorded. Now that makes things very, very impersonal. In other words, you can't ask the teacher a question and and it's and it becomes a, a, a really a very very difficult thing. So um, and in terms of of certain lectures, if there are, um, um, for example, the scheduling of this event was done in such a way that it was convenient for me. Uh, so it's eight o'clock. So it started eight o'clock New New Haven time. And I don't know what time it is in Beijing. I'm guessing it's it's a, it's late in the evening, right? Right. Yeah. And and so there there will need to be kind of a thinking about how to actually organize where you want to have an interaction with a student, because you want to have the interactions. You want to have um, um, uh, Vespra. We want to be able to speak to you. We want to be able to answer your question in real time. And, and so they'll, they'll need to be that kind of function. And this, you know, and this is an unfortunate thing. I mean, I mean so when you're planning something like this, there will, there will be an, uh, some students who are in London, for example, right now. So trying to get London, Beijing, and let's say Sydney, Australia, uh, all on the same live lecture, I'll tell you, is very, very complicated. Um, and and, uh, and it'll, it'll be a challenge, but we will get through this. We will get through this. Great. Thank you. Um, and, and I'm sure there are many people who have very similar concerns. Um, let's move on to the next question here. Jeannie, I'm going to unmute you. Hello. Oh, hi, G. Uh, hello. I, uh, it's my honor to raise the question here. Uh, actually, I have a, a personal question about uh, uh, losing sleep because um, I, 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 have, uh, I have depression after I give birth to my child for uh, five years ago. After that, I often lose sleep. I only sleep for two to five hours a day uh, but i uh, become more exciting at the night um so in this case how can i solve the problem just like uh, mm, 
uh, do I need to take the medicine or just to uh, have some skill to fix my problem? Well, um, where do you live? Uh, I live in Shenzhen, China, which uh, yeah. near Hong Kong. Near Hong Kong. So uh, I know um, there are some excellent sleep doctors in Hong Kong itself. Oh. Uh, physicians who are involved in sleep medicine. And one of my colleagues who's there, her name is Dr. Mary Ip, I-P. Um, and yeah. she's an excellent doctor and I would go to see her. So the current trend in someone who's having trouble falling asleep and staying asleep is not to give them sleeping pills, but to do something called cognitive behavioral therapy. And cognitive behavioral therapy is, is, is not, it's usually done by a psychologist. And the psychologist doesn't delve into your life and, and you know, whether or not, you, you know, your, your father beat you or anything like that. What the psychologist does is they teach you how to fall asleep. All of us are born with the ability to fall asleep and some people lose that ability and with cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, uh, therapy, they actually teach you how to fall asleep again and it's very effective. <clears throat> and if that doesn't work, then we will do sleeping pills. And in the book that was mentioned early on uh, uh, at the very beginning of this, my book, Mystery of Sleep, there's an entire chapter on how to treat insomnia without pills. And I, you know, I don't know whether the translation is good or bad because I don't speak or read Chinese, um, but uh, that'll give you an idea of what cognitive behavioral therapy does. Many okay. people, many women develop depression after childbirth. It's not rare at all. Uh, you're not unusual, about 10 to 20% of women go through this and and um and the depressive part of it needs to be treated and i and i don't want to get into your specific case um but if if, if a woman has um, postpartum depression that needs to be treated and insomnia is only one dimension of that so the other thing about about uh, you know a new baby at home is that yeah. Even without depression, there's a loss of sleep that the average woman uh, uh, who's taking care of, of a baby at night because of breastfeeding, baby crying, baby needs to be changed. It can be a very, very difficult time. And the person, besides possibly having insomnia, they will also be very, very sleepy during the daytime. So one of the advice that I, uh, that I give new mothers who are going through this is try to get help at night. Get, uh, if, there's, uh, if there's a father or someone else in the home who can help you say, look, I need, I, I need to sleep. Please help me take care of my child some nights. So don't be afraid to ask for help people will gladly help in that kind of situation. Great. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, let's keep going here. Anna, I'm gonna unmute you. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you great. Where are you, Anna? I'm in Beijing. Okay, it's almost time to go to bed, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just have two questions about the brain work of sleep. So the first question is that um, sometimes when I have a lack of sleep, so for instance, just six hours or five hours, I don't feel tired the next day, but I feel tired the day after next day. So I mm -hmm. just want to know what is the brain work behind that? Why is that the case? So, and okay, go ahead. Let me answer one question at a time and I'll get back to you. That is a very, very uh, interesting question because there are many people that, that sleep five or six hours a night and then on weekends they'll, you know, they'll sleep like 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever. And what happens is that as you accumulate what we call a sleep debt, you should be sleeping, how, how old are you?
Anyways, you should be sleeping somewhere. 17. Above, you're 17? Yeah. Okay. You should be sleeping about nine hours a night or nine out of 24 hours. So on the first night, you're three hours short. The second night, you're another three hours short. So by the, the following night, you're now six hours short. And that's why you are sleepy. And there's been a lot of research that has shown that sleep debt accumulates and that if you're only sleeping six hours a night after about a week, as far as your brain is concerned, you're as sleepy as if you hadn't slept at all, okay? So chronic sleep deprivation and sleep debt, it continues to go up. Mm, okay, I see. What was your second question, Anna? Uh, my second question is that, when I sleep later, for example, like after 12, I actually wake up earlier, like without the alarm. So for example, today I woke up at like 6, 6 a.m. and I slept at like 12.30 yesterday. And this kind of keep occurring. So I'm not sure why is that the case. Uh, uh, say that again, uh, when are you going to bed? Like 12.30. 12.30 at night? Yeah, and then I just naturally woke up at 6. Okay, so, so have, you, have you tried going to bed an hour or two earlier? Yeah, when I do that, I can, I can sleep for over eight hours straight without waking up. So I just so want to know why is that the no, case? No, no, because you're going to bed too late. Um, you know, in other words... Um, people are going to wake up at the time they normally wake up. We have a circadian rhythm and the circadian rhythm is it's like a clock in our brain that tells us when we're going to wake up and it tells us when to go to sleep. And it tells us the way it tells us it's time to go to sleep. We become sleepy and you're probably sleepy about 10 o'clock in the evening but you're fighting it, you're watching television, you're doing social media, you're doing all the stuff I told you not to do. I feel like your father or something. You shouldn't do that stuff. Um, and, and if you, because you'll function way better during the daytime if you've slept the right amount. Okay, so do you mean that sleeping late just disturb my circadian rhythm? That's why I'm waking up. Yeah. And, yeah. And not, okay, I get it yeah. now. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, let's keep moving on here, Flyer. Okay. Go ahead, Flyer. Uh, Flora. Uh, you have to unmute. No. Okay, well, uh, Flyer, if you can ask, I can, since you typed out the question. So the question is, um, as a Chinese uh, high school student, I have to go to bed at an appointed time. Uh, when I can't sleep at that specific time, should I read or think about some learning problems or try to empty my brain? So what's the best solution if you are supposed to go to sleep at a certain time, but you're uh, not able to fall asleep? Yeah, so part of that depends on a person's um, circadian rhythm. Um, and um, I'd like to ask Flora a couple of questions before answering uh, the, uh, Flora, can you speak? Oh, sorry, this is, this is from another person named Flyer, um, oh, Flyer. And they apparently cannot turn on their microphone right now. They cannot. Okay, so here, here's the deal. And this is especially true in people that are uh, college age, uh, 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 who are college age, in other words, between 18 and let's say 25. So many people develop what we call a delayed sleep phase. And what that mean, means is that their body clock, their circadian system, which, is, which resides in the middle of their brain, all of a sudden says, you know, I'm not going to get sleepy until... Uh, until midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. And I want to sleep in until 
10 o'clock in the morning, even, even noon. In other words, this is a very, very common problem um, uh, among students. And uh, when a student, and, and you know, when a student is, is having trouble falling asleep because they're not sleepy, their brain hasn't told them to go to sleep and they lie in bed, they become frustrated at not sleeping and they will develop insomnia because of that. Hmm. And so, um, so that's one of these situations where uh, the student needs to um, um, sort of figure out how to deal with this. And one of the ways of dealing with this is to take courses and classes that are a little bit later in the day than early on in the morning. It's a very difficult thing to sort of deal with, but a lot of students that I've encountered who have this problem at, the, at Yale, as an example, they will take classes that do not begin at eight o'clock in the morning. They'll take classes that begin at about 10 o'clock, or sometimes all their classes are going to be in the afternoon. Yeah, that was definitely my strategy during college. <laughs> um, great. Uh, Ming-Chi has a very, very interesting question that I think comes up quite a bit. I'm going to ask them to ask the question. Oh, hi, hello. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to just read my question. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because I, I tap it up. So, um, like, I've read books on uh, sleeping. I think, like, most Western studies, they focus on the, um, the, the waves, the brain waves, like alpha, beta, like the phrases you have to go on through to measure your sleep quality. But in traditional Chinese, uh, Chinese medicine, uh, the belief is that, like, when do you get to sleep and when do you wake up, like, sort of matters. And it varies from seasons to seasons. Like now we're in summer, so we should go to bed early and uh, get up early. I believe, yeah, I believe that that is uh, the, yeah, for summer. So uh, I'm wondering what's your idea about yeah. it? Do you yes. agree with it? Or do you think like just the hours matters? Like when? So, well, yeah, no matter what season you're in, you need to sleep a certain number of hours. Now, the, so we all have, as I mentioned, we have this clock that's in the middle of our brain. And what synchronizes the clock is sunlight. It's light that actually synchronizes our, our clock. Um, and so in the summer, it's bright um, much earlier than it is in the, um, in the, winter and hmm. so your schedule so that is the natural schedule the natural schedule uh is actually going to vary with the seasons but the key thing is to try to go to bed at a time when mm -hmm. when so that you will get whatever you need for most people it's between mm -hmm. seven and nine hours uh be some somewhere between seven and nine hours so in, before you go to bed, keeping that in mind, stay away from screens. Don't go, to in, um, don't go in a place that's very, very bright. Don't go to a place that's very, very bright uh, because of that's going to keep you from falling asleep. The movie that I showed you at the very beginning, the one with Al Pacino, uh, if you're bored, watch that movie because the movie explains about the importance of sunlight. The movie takes place in Alaska during the summer when they have 24 hour a day sunlight. And that causes sleep problems because it, it, it messes up the person's circadian rhythm. And that's what the movie is about, that this uh, Al Pacino plays a detective um, and, his, and he develops severe insomnia in part because of all the sun uh, uh, exposure. So as long as you get your seven to nine hours, I don't care how you get it, um, you should do fine. Uh, I'm sorry. So just want to clarify. So you agree that we should sync 
with the sun? Yep, we are creatures of the sun. <laughs> The, 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 the sun is the musical conductor of our lives. And in fact, all life, it's not just people, it's all animals. They're, they're all animals, their, their lives, their circadian rhythm are controlled by the rhythms of the sun. Okay. Thanks. That really answers my question. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Great. And I think Flora has a Similar question, but Flora, do you have any follow-up that might be slightly different? Yeah, I have the, just the similar question with Mingqi. Uh, I want to know, should we sleep at a fixed time? Should you go to sleep at a fixed time? Yes. Absolutely. Yes, you should, you should go to sleep at a fixed time. And, and, uh, and, you sh and the fixed time should correspond to when you first start to feel sleepy, the urge to go to sleep. Now, are, are you uh, here at Yale or are you in Beijing? Yes, I'm in Beijing. You're in Beijing. Okay, so in about an hour or two, you need to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think it's early. <laughs> you think it's early? Well, three hours tops, right? What, yeah. time, is, what time is it in Beijing now? Ah, uh, 12 hour time difference. So it's nine. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So nine. You, should, you know, uh, you should be going to sleep in uh, Flora in like an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, I usually sleep at half past 11. Okay. And do you feel wide awake and alert in the morning? Uh, yes. I. Uh, I always wake up at half past six. Okay. So, yeah, so you're about seven hours. So that's, that's, that's perfect. Yes. And you don't need coffee to wake up in the morning, right? Uh, yes, but I'm quite sleepy at noon. You're sleepy at noon. Okay. You need to increase your sleep time by about a half an hour. Uh, okay. Got it. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can sneak in a couple more here. Sally? Sally, are you there? Okay. Uh, I guess the question is about certain sleeping patterns sleeping 20 minutes while working, then four hours, then repeat it again. I'm um, actually not sure what that question is. Let's move on to, um, I guess, Mia. Mia, where are you? Go ahead, Mia. Hi, Professor. Thank Hello, you. how are you? Uh, I'm are, you are you in Beijing? No, I'm in Shanghai. Shanghai, <laughs> okay, beautiful city. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing. It's just I have a personal question. I usually sleep like uh, six to eight hours a night, but every morning I wake up feeling really drowsy, like I never slept at all. And I wonder if anyone have the similar question, or is that my personal? Uh, I don't know. No, no. I mean, what uh, what you're describing is very common. So, most nights, are you six or are you eight hours? uh maybe seven ish uh sometimes it's eight sometimes it's seven yeah yeah um so have do you never um do you use an alarm clock to wake up yeah yeah why uh because i have to because i have a class to attend if i don't use a clock maybe i will wake up really really late like Okay. So, okay. So, how late is really late? Mm, in the noon, maybe after eleven a.m. is really late for me. So, on weekends, uh, when you don't have class, do you sleep in? Do you sleep in? Yeah, sometimes. And how do you feel that day? Uh, feel like I've wasted like a whole morning and. Uh, <sighs> Yeah, just feel like I wasted. No, no, no. 
so much time. Huh? I'm not asking you whether you feel you wasted. I'm asking how you feel. Do you feel alert? Do you feel happy? Do you feel depressed? How do you feel? Oh, definitely feel more alert than I okay. wake up early. So what your body is telling you is that you need more sleep than you're getting. Oh. Okay. In other words, you are capable. You are capable of feeling wide awake and alert if you get the right amount of sleep. So okay? that means, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there are some people that have a disease called narcolepsy, and other diseases, um, uh, sleep apnea, which you don't have. Um, w when a person has a sleep disorder, it doesn't matter how much they sleep. They sleep 12 hours and still feel, feel sleepy. The fact that you can f uh, feel wide awake and alert after sleeping more um, tells me that you're, you are normal. And what you need to do is to figure out how to get to probably nine hours of sleep um, as opposed to six to eight. Thank you. I will try it like this weekend. Thank you so okay. much. You're welcome. I suspect many people have a very similar issue where they're not getting enough sleep. Um, uh, Victoria has a great question. Victoria? Yeah, so I read books and saw videos about this, how there's like this morning person who always wakes up early, but there's also night owls who like their rhythm is to go to bed late. Is that like scientifically proven? Well, yeah, uh, it's scientifically proven in that if you did a survey and there's some, there are actually um, instruments that we use, sort of questionnaires that we use where we define whether someone um, is, is a morning person or an evening person. And, and they have different personalities. They go to sleep at different times um, and, and uh, they see the world very, very differently. Um, and, and, um, it can, most of the time, that is not a real big problem. Mm -hmm. It becomes a problem when, uh, so we call a person who goes to bed really late a night owl, uh, and we call someone that wakes up really early a lark. And when you have a situation where a lark marries a night owl, you have a real problem. And so you have one partner who goes to bed at two o'clock in the morning and the other partner has already been asleep for three to four hours. And, and so that can actually cause real big issues uh, in, in relationships. Um, so a night owl, someone that stays up really late, um, they need to be very careful about what they do with their life, right? someone who's a night owl will never be able to be an anesthesiologist uh, um, or, or, uh, or have a job that begin or a surgeon. Sur surgery will, uh, surgeons will often get up five o'clock in the morning. So if you're going to bed at two o'clock in the morning and, and uh, you try to be a surgeon and wake up at five or six, I don't want you to operate on me, right? And, and, and so, the, the, so it turns out that a lot of people who are night owls, they choose a career path, not even thinking about this, um, that is consistent with their body clock. So people that are night owls will, will frequently go into the entertainment business. I've had patients who are actors, directors, uh, people that own uh, restaurants, that kind of thing. Uh, and they they can be very very successful, or they can be in the music world where they do their performances uh, in the evening, and the the larks the people that wake up early in the morning they frequently will go into medicine nursing anesthesia those kind of careers as as well. So um, so what you're describing is very very real. So how do we determine, like, are we supposed to know which type we are? Well, there's actually a questionnaire, uh, it w which is called a morningness, eveningness uh, 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 
instrument questionnaire. And if you go on the web and you just put in those two things, the, the questionnaire is going to pop up. You'll do it. What do you think you are? I have no idea because before I was in school and then I had these classes really late at night, but now I have to wake up at six to walk my dog. So like now I get tired at like nine, but like three weeks ago, I get tired at 1 a.m. So I don't really know. You need to stop walking your dog at six <laughs> o'clock in the morning. I mean, my God. So, so you can't have your dog kind of d determine your life, right? So if your dog wakes up at six o'clock in the morning, you're going to have to go to bed early. That's what you're going to have to do. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, it seems that, that even with the night owl and morning lark distinction, that mo many cultures sort of have this more positive view of morning people and there seems to be oh, a yeah. negative relationship with night people so i what why do you have any sense of why that is well um a lot of it i think it um so um so for example um uh, benjamin franklin in, in the u.s uh wrote about you know uh, about waking up early uh right. early to bed early to rise makes a person wise and that kind of stuff so that that was sort of true until the early 1900s and what changed the world was the light bulb yeah okay because all of a sudden all of a sudden there were things that were going on 24 hours a day and and the light bulb and electricity and now with the you know with a 24-hour world on the web uh, things are changing um, and 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 you know whenever you order something on Amazon at two o'clock in the morning there's somebody awake at that time <laughs> who's sort of going to go and put whatever you ordered into a package and ship it off so you get it the next day the the reality is is that things have changed and whether or not we like it and a lot of people don't like it I don't like it um, uh, we're going to have to get used to the fact that that people uh, people's schedules are going to be very uh, they are going to change, you know. And 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 there's nothing we can do about that right now. But the important message I want to leave with 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 the listeners is that no matter what get the right amount of sleep over 24 hours whatever your job is whatever your schedule is whatever you are doing because if you don't sleep enough you're going to feel miserable the next day and you won't be that productive and people won't want to be around you because you're going to be grumpy and irritable great well i think in the interest of time so that people can go to sleep at a early enough time uh, we'll stop there i know there are still many many more questions. Um, uh, yeah, if, if people want to get in touch with me, uh, they can always email me at Yale and great. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, so uh, Professor has very generously offered to answer questions via email. Um, he's also, I noticed very early on, uh, his, his name on his Zoom is actually his email address, so he was very uh, he's done his he's done his zoom before so he knows <laughs> and he's done his presentations before so he knows that that is bound to happen so uh, again i'm sorry that we weren't able to get to everybody's questions uh, i know that there's a lot out there um, feel free to email um, uh, professor dr Krager, and he has very generously agreed um, to allow you to do that um, thank you everybody uh, for those of you that asked the first five questions uh, and we, we do also have a record of who those are, but if, if you could also take the initiative to email Yale Center Beijing at yale.edu or uh, leave a note via WeChat, uh, we will be sure to get your address so that we can send you your books from the publisher. Thank you again to the publisher um, in China for sponsoring that and allowing that to happen. And for those of you guys that aren't going to get the free books, uh, please, please consider buying the book. It's a wonderful resource. And as I'm sure we've all discovered, sleep is extremely important. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Krager, for a fantastic lecture, um, as always. 
and uh, everybody in China, please, please have a good night. Okay, bye bye. Yo, bye bye. And I'm bye going bye. to unmute everybody so that they can say thank you to you. Uh, okay, thank you cool. for allowing me into your life today. Yes. So everybody's going to be unmuted so they can say thank you. And please turn on your camera so that we can take a group picture. Oh, that would be cool. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.